afternoon. Uh, thank you for your kind and generous introduction. Um, I'd first like to say that I'm truly honored to be here today. Unlike the other distinguished guests who spoke before me and who sit beside me, I have done nothing extraordinary to deserve a voice on this platform. And I'm truly humbled to be in their presence. I'm not an expert in international human rights or even Chinese human rights. I am but a 21-year-old college student born and raised in the comfort of Canada. But while I have never experienced imprisonment, torture, or been ill-treated, what I can do is tell you a story of how the fists of a government that crushed down on peaceful protesters at Tiananmen Square in 1989 and all calls for political reform since can reach across the Pacific and touch the lives of people like me. Let me start by telling you a little about my father, Wang Bingzhang. He was a Chinese medical student who came to Canada to do his PhD at McGill University, where I study now. There he became familiar with the freedoms and liberties of democratic society. So just as he was about to graduate in 1982, he decided to give up a career in medicine to devote himself completely to Chinese pro-democracy activism. A true idealist, my father spent the next 20 years of his life founding and developing the Chinese pro-democracy movement in North America. He started several publications and was the founder of numerous Chinese-American democratic parties. In 1989, he tried to enter China to support the demonstrations at Tiananmen Square, but was refused entry. Instead, he decided to name me Tiana to commemorate the victims of the massacre. Despite the many challenges and hardships he faced, my father toiled relentlessly for, the, for his cause, stumbling many parts of the way, but never giving up his dream of a free democratic China. In the summer of 2002, when I was 13 years old, my father traveled to Vietnam with two colleagues to meet with, to meet with um, mainland Chinese labor activists. He then disappeared for six months. During this time, the Chinese government repeatedly denied having any information about my father's whereabouts. It was only when his colleagues were released did we find out that he had been in custody. My father and his companions were kidnapped from Vietnam, brought to China where they were arrested by Chinese authorities. After a half-day trial where no evidence was presented and my father, who was unaware of his charges and not allowed to speak, he was, my father was sentenced to life imprisonment in solitary confinement for uh, terrorism and espionage. He then lost his 45-minute appeal. He has since remained confined in a single-cell prison in Xiaoguan, China, languishing alone while my family members take m turns to visit. Now in his 60s, my father is no longer the charismatic young man he used to be. Since his imprisonment, he has suffered many illnesses and, numer and numerous strokes. With nobody to comfort him in his anguish and anxiety, you can only imagine the toll his confinement has taken on his psychological health. It has been eight years since my family has been campaigning for his freedom, an endeavor that has drained us physically, emotionally, and in the hopes of winning his release, I myself have taken some time off from school to, um, to lobby full-time for his release in Washington, D.C., trying, trying to raise the awareness of his case. But despite everything we have done, the international support we have received, the resolutions passed and the letters signed, my father remains in prison. And we, and we all live with the guilt of feeling like we haven't done enough while we try to cope with other aspects of life. Deaths and births, illnesses and marriages are all happening half away a world away from my father who in the meantime can do nothing but helplessly wait for the day he can be with his family. His aging mother, his recently widowed sister and his new granddaughter. So the repercussions of human rights abuse in China are far reaching and severe and extremely painful. To be, to be first kidnapped, arrested, detained, beaten, kept in solitary confinement, unfairly tried, silenced for his beliefs, this is what lies ahead for people who dare to speak out against the government in China. His plight paints a heartbreaking picture of the reality of, the reality of human rights abuse in China. To be ignored, demoralized, intimidated, humili humiliated, and even punished, this is what it is to fight for human rights in China. 
We know that there are countless examples of similar, similarly tragic cases, and I know all too well the pain and helplessness their families must be feeling. So today I speak before you today, embodying the legacy that my father entrusted in me to thank all the human rights men all the human rights defenders here for their relentless dedication in pressing for the protection of human rights around the world. And I urge you to continue your fight by sending a message to your leaders and encouraging members of your community, community to uphold the principles of freedom and human rights by pressuring the Chinese government to release these prisoners. And finally, um, I ask you to learn more about the, these prisoners, their cause, their plight, and their struggle for freedom, and to keep telling the human stories of human rights abuse, the ones that we've heard today, to whoever is willing to listen. With your help, I can hope that, um, well, with, with, your, with your help and concern, your help and concern helps safeguard the lives of people like my father. Without it, I know their suffering would be um, many times worse. With your help, I can hope for the day that my father will return home. Thank you for listening and for giving me the chance to tell what it is to struggle for human rights in China.